This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. This uh, session, I've got, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Vanessa Cropley. Uh, Dr. Cropley is a Senior Research Fellow also at MNC. Uh, she holds an NHMRC Emerging Leadership Investigator Grant and she is also a Dame Kate Campbell Fellow. She currently leads the trans Translational Neurobiology Group and her research is focused on investigating the relationship between the brain, biology and behaviour in mental illness, including psychotic illness and adolescent onset mental health disorders. She's got a particular interest in understanding these relationships from a developmental and biopsychosocial framework, um, seeking to understand how typical and atypical brain development both affects and is affected by the emergence of mental illness, the environment and biological and psychosocial factors. So today, uh, Dr is going to present on some of her um, cutting edge work on the immune system and psychosis, which I'm really excited to hear about. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Tam, and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Now, can you see that okay? Yep. I'll assume it is. Um, so thanks yep. for having um, me here today. Um, thanks for lovely introduction and thank you um, to Maria and Chris Davey for inviting me to speak. And I apologize that I'm not um, um, there today. I was planning to be there in person, but it hasn't um, eventuated. Um, so I'll just get started then in terms of the talk. So when um, Maria firstly asked me to present, um, I had a little bit of trouble firstly thinking of what I would actually talk about because um, the work that I, I do is quite varied. Um, some of the most recent work that I'm doing at the moment is more so focusing on different psychosocial and other factors such as sleep and early life adversity on brain development, as Tamsin just mentioned. But some of the more earlier work and some work that I still continue to do has been investigating the immune system um, across the psychosis spectrum. So I thought that I would actually focus um, on some of these studies that I've done over the last um, several years as listed uh, here. And I might have to um, go quickly through some of the slides because I think I'm a little bit over time. Oops. So firstly, before I get started, I just want to make a couple of um, really pivotal acknowledgements. And I want to acknowledge um, um, at the outset two individuals, firstly, Maria DiBiase and Lily Lascaris. Um, they were former PhD students uh, with me and um, they've been really integral to the work that I will be talking about today and they did some of these studies for their PhD so I just want to uh, acknowledge them um, at the outset. Um, so I'll just give a really brief overview of some of the evidence that has linked inflammation in the psychosis spectrum. So some of this evidence has come from a number of different pieces or areas. Um, for example, there is epidemiological evidence that has really observed um, a higher risk of developing schizophrenia in uh, people who have been born to mothers who are exposed to viruses such as influenza um, during pregnancy. And um, some animal studies have largely verified this association. And they've done this, um, you know, using experimentally induced maternal immune challenges that have shown some various sort of schizophrenia, schizophrenia related phenotypic characteristics in the offspring. Um, in terms of genetic studies, some of the uh, gene wide association studies have identified a cluster of genetic risk alleles um, for schizophrenia in a region of the genome which is really responsible for immune regulation. And this is called the major histocompatibility complex. So, this has really implicated immunological pathways in psychosis. Um, in humans, there's been a number of studies that have um, examined or revealed alterations in different immune molecules in peripheral blood assays. Um, and some early studies um, have implicated microglial cells in people with psychosis using um, positron emission tomography, although I will touch on that a bit later. So these various lines or pieces of evidence have really led to various immune hypotheses of schizophrenia, although the evidence of these sort of uh, theories are still often inconsistent and mixed and are quite nuanced. So the studies that we have done are not really completing this puzzle at all, but I hope that they are um, adding to it in some way. So um, as I just mentioned, um, microglia cells have been implicated in schizophrenia um, previously. Um, but firstly, what exactly are microglial cells? 
So these cells are the resident immune cells of the brain, and they really mediate immune processes, essentially by um, responding to, to their local environments. So in normal conditions, microglia cells are considered to be in this ramified kind of state as characterized by this um, depiction of their morphology. Um, but in response to some type of neuronal damage or pathology or infection, they transition to this activating state. And so here their morphology will change, their processes will really thicken and retract, um, and they will migrate to the site of pathology. And because the activated microglia can actually uh, release different cytotoxic molecules to respond to the pathology, um, they are considered markers of neuroinflammation, um, although they do have a variety of different functions, some of them listed here. So in living humans, um, microglial activation can be indirectly indexed with positron emission tomography and used in radio ligands that bind to something called the translocator protein or TSPO. And so these um, TSPO are expressed on the outer surface of mitochondria and they're particularly located or expressed on microglial cells. Um, and so when microglia actually transition from this ramified to this activating state, the TSPO become upregulated. So because of this increased radio ligand binding to TSPO, um, this um, sort of uh, scanner acquisition is thought to index the level of microglial activation in vivo. So some early studies um, now conducted more than a decade ago um, actually reported increased binding to TSPO in people with schizophrenia. And some of these earlier studies are listed here. There's just one study out of these that showed no change in binding. And so they, they reported increased binding, particularly in individuals at the earlier stages of illness. So these early studies really provided us with the motivation or impetus to examine um, putative microglial activation across the uh, psychosis spectrum um, and also to examine its uh, putative relationship with different clinical and biological vari uh, variables. So this study um, was led by Maria Di Biase. And so this was our PET TSPO study that was first sort of commenced about eight years ago now. And this um, examined putative microglial activity as a function of illness course. And so in this study, we quantified TSPO with the radio tracer PK11195. And we did this in individuals who were deemed to be at clinical or ultra high risk for psychosis, recent onsets or, or predominantly first episode schizophrenia, as well as um, established chronic schizophrenia. And they were um, matched to um, healthy controls. And at the time, this was the largest PET TSPO study in, in psychosis. And it was also embedded in a longitudinal design. So what did we find? So, so essentially, contrary to our hypothesis and our expectation that TSPO would be particularly upregulated in individual, individuals at the earlier stage of illness, we didn't actually find any differences in TSPO binding across um, the, the groups. So it wasn't actually um, different in any of the patient groups in comparison to their healthy counterparts. Um, and this is a plot showing the the actual um, uh, the binding values across our a priori regions of interest. We also verified this with um, uh, voxel wise um, associations as well. Um, so if anything, we actually found a trend for lower TSPO in the recent onset schizophrenia group and somewhat in the um, clinical high risk group in comparison to younger healthy controls in the insular and the interior cingulate cortex, although this didn't actually reach significance. So at the time, this was actually a surprising finding for us. And we did conduct a number of different secondary analyses, including verifying the different metrics that we were using to evaluate TSPO. Um, one of the other um, analyses um, explored the effect of medication status on regional PK11195 binding. And we did this um, by stratifying our different patient groups into those that were not treated at the time with antipsychotic medication and those who actually were treated with antipsychotic medication. Though it is to be noted that the untreated group was actually quite small in this um, analysis. And in these analyses, we actually found um, significantly lower TSPO, TSPO binding in those that were untreated in um, comparison to either healthy controls or the antipsychotic treated group in a number of regions, including the medial temporal 
um, thalamic insula and the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and so this actually uh, suggests that medication may be actually having an influence on the TSPO binding. And we were also interested in this study to examine various correlations between PK1195 binding and some different clinical and biological variables. This included um, symptoms as well as brain um, gray matter volume and actual peripheral uh, cytokines. We didn't actually find any associations um, with any of those variables. The only association we did actually uh, reveal was um, between age and the Lamic TSPO binding, which indicated higher or older age. Um, was associated with higher TSPO binding in this region. So overall, this study was actually quite um, negative. Um, so as I mentioned, this was surprising to us at the time um, because it wasn't something that we expected. It wasn't something that the, the previous literature had actually indicated. But we weren't the only um, group to be examining TSPO with PET imaging at that time. And it was actually being done by a number of different groups around the world. It was actually quite a topical area of interest at that time. So since then, a number of different um, studies have been published, which have also led to different meta-analyses. And a couple of years ago, one meta-analysis um, was done um, that focused on the second generation TSPO um, ligands. And in this meta-analysis, they actually uh, revealed lower TSPO binding in the patient or individuals with schizophrenia compared to healthy controls. And another meta-analysis conducted around the same time uh, reported no change in TSPO binding when they actually focused in on that same uh, particular metric to examine TSPO um, in patients versus controls, although they did also indicate lower TSPO in those that were untreated with antipsychotic medication. So our, our study you know, broadly aligns with these two uh, meta-analyses. And overall, it doesn't really support the notion of there being increased microglial activity across the psychosis spectrum, particularly at that early phase of illness. So you know, what does that mean for things such as the neuroinflammatory hypothesis? It um, is still somewhat unclear. Um, it's possible that there might be a subpopulation that exists that might actually um, display this increased microglial activity, or it's possible that um, PET TSPO itself may not be very sensitive to detecting these kind of quite subtle or likely subtle levels of um, microglial uh, activation or perhaps even other forms of microglial pathology. So I think these questions are still um, being empirically investigated and are yet to be elucidated. So I'm just going to move on to another study that was led by, uh, again, PhD student at the time, Lily Lascaris. So um, in the, this study, we we're interested in examining what impacts peripheral inflammation might have on brain morphology. And this was done because the inflammatory hypothesis of schizophrenia broadly proposes that um, chronic dysregulation of peripheral and central inflammatory systems over time might actually contribute to some of the neuronal or synaptic um, pathology or dysfunction that is um, commonly seen in the illness. So whilst uh, there is some evidence that um, circulating cytokines are associated with smaller grey matter volumes within schizophrenia spectrum disorder, um, when uh, Lily actually appraised the literature, she did note that there was quite a bit of inconsistency. And this was um, in part due to a lot of heterogeneity in the cytokines and regions examined, as well as the stage of illness of the patients. So in particular, what Lily um, actually sort of found was that most studies focused on a very limited number of cytokines as well as brain regions. And we thought that this may have overlooked some potentially interesting relationships that had just not existed previously or featured in the existing literature. So in this study that she, she led, um, we were interested in ascertaining whether there were particular brain regions that might be more vulnerable to circulating levels of cytokines um, and whether there might be specific cytokines that might be more influential than others. And also whether the relationship between cytokines and brain structure might, might differ um, at early to late stages of the illness. So in this study, um, we included 175 participants. Some um, participants actually overlapped with the previous PET study. Um, and this uh, consisted of individuals at first episode psychosis, established chronic schizophrenia, as well as um, healthy controls. Um, and using a data-driven approach, we examined a, a, a larger number of cytokines and brain regions that had previously kind of been assayed within the literature. 
And we, here are the list of um, cytokines that we examined. Those in red are the pro-inflammatory cytokines, whilst those in blue um, uh, broadly have anti-inflammatory effects. And we examined 11 brain regions or structures that were deemed to, to provide a, a, a fairly broad cross-section of the um, brain. And just to note that um, when we actually examined um, the level of cytokines between our patient groups to healthy controls, um, the cytokine levels in blood didn't actually significantly differ in either the FEC or the chronic schizophrenia group. So it's important to note that this sample was not kind of manifesting this sort of um, systemic inflammation. <clears throat> So I won't actually go into much detail about this, but um, given we're interested in a, a, a relatively large number of cytokines in brain regions, we decided to first implement um, a, a particular pre-screening or parameter reduction approach um, to narrow down the, the number of cytokines in brain regions that we were going to investigate. And we did this so we wouldn't have this kind of a large number of pairwise comparisons that we were conducting. And so we consulted with a statistician now, I won't go into detail about the actual sort of methods, but I just want to orient you to the particular circles under this dashed line here. Um, and these indicate the particular cytokines paired with the particular brain regions that um, were most consistently associated with each other across the whole sample. And for ease of interpretation, um, this uh, table here to the right actually lists the particular cytokine and brain region pairs that were most consistently associated. And these were the um, particular pairs that were then selected for subsequent analysis. And this is the approach that we decided to do rather than actually just selecting particular cytokines and brain regions a priori. So here you can see that um, the frontal thickness was actually disproportionately associated with peripheral cytokines. You can also see that some um, regions were absent, such as the hippocampus, and also um, some you know, cytokines that aren't typically sort of seen in the literature were actually identified, such including some anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as um, IL-13 and 4. Um, so here, after we identified these particular um, cytokine and brain region pairs, um, we were more so interested in investigating whether um, these particular um, uh, relationships were moderated by diagnostic status. And so we did this on the eight particular models that we identified as in the previous table. And we found a significant moderating effect of diagnosis on the six of these cytokine brain models. And these are shown in the plots here to the right. And broadly, um, you can see that um, this was, um, the nature of these relationships were driven by there being a positive association in healthy controls, which are in the, the green shading. So this indicated that higher levels of circulating cytokines were associated with higher frontal cortical thickness. Whereas in the um, first episode patients, which are in the orange shading, um, this was driven by a negative association. So this indicates that higher circulating levels of cytokines um, were associated with lower either thickness or total brain volume. And when we conducted simple slope um, analyses, these were significant in healthy controls for these particular um, cytokine brain region pairs. So it was for those in terms of the frontal cortical thickness. Um, and they were significant in first episode psychosis um, for these particular cytokines and total cortical volume. Um, and there were no associations that were found in the, the chronic schizophrenia group. So because um, the frontal cortical thickness actually comprised of a number of different subregions, we implemented some sort of secondary analyses to examine whether there are particular regions within the frontal cortex that might have been more so associated with these selected cytokines. And so again, we found that there was a positive association between the different cytokines um, and frontal cortical thickness in healthy controls. They were quite similar across all of the cytokines and they in implicated some sort of orbital lateral regions. Um, it also extended into the superior frontal gyrus for interfering gamma. Um, and we found it one significant uh, negative association of first episode psychosis um, for IL-5. And um, this was within the 
middle frontal or, or I think the, the dorsal caudal middle frontal region. So just to quickly summarise of this um, um, finding. Um, so we found that while there was no evidence for systemic inflammation um, in our particular sample, um, specific cy cytokines were associated with brain structure differently across the diagnostic groups. So we found that higher levels of pro, pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines were associated with larger brain structure in the healthy controls, whereas higher pro-inflammatory cytokines were associated with smaller brain structure in first episode psychosis, whilst no associations were detected in the chronic schizophrenia group. So again, to, we were interested in this study to kind of determine whether there might be particular brain regions that might be more sensitive or vulnerable to circulating levels of cytokines. So in this study, we found that the frontal cortex may be particularly sensitive to this variation. And we're also interested in this study to determine whether the relationships might actually differ depending on the particular stage of illness of um, the um, patients. And so again, in this study, um, this indicated that the early stage of illness might be a more vulnerable or maybe a more vulnerable to these effects of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And lastly, in this study, we found that the links between brain morphology and the different inflammatory molecules might actually involve um, cytokines that that are not typically examined in the literature. We found a particular sort of association with anti-inflammatory cytokines, which hadn't been previously um, seen or reported. <clears throat> so I'll just move on. Um, so in addition to gray matter morphology, we have also been interested in examining the impact of circulating level of cytokines on white matter micro microstructure. Um, given evidence for some of these associations uh, within the literature. So in particular, we did this with diffusion weighted imaging, and this was led by, uh, again, Maria, who is um, a bit of an expert in this area. And one of the most conventional um, measures of a, a diffusion or diff one of the most conventional diffusion measures is um, fractional anisotropy or FA, which essentially measures the motion of water molecules in the biological tissue. Um, but there is a, a relatively sort of new technique that actually um, corrects for the free water. So it's called free water imaging or free water correction. Um, and this is a post-processing technique that essentially sort of separates um, the, the unique contributions of um, intracellular as well as extracellular um, water molecules from this diffusion signal. And so this can then be um, uh, can then generate different maps. So it can generate a free water corrected diffusion map, or in the case of FA, a tissue specific FA map, as well as a free water map. And these different um, signals can be modeled separately. So what is uh, what has been most interest interesting to us um, is that this particular free water map is has been proposed to be a marker of neuroinflammation. Um, and so although this interpretation has received some sort of support in animal models, it has been largely unsubstantiated in, in humans. And because it was this marker of neuroinflammation or proposed to be this marker of neuroinflammation, um, we wanted to examine this further, particularly given our absence of um, effects using the PET-TSPO imaging. So in this study, um, we examined the influence of eight circulating um, levels of cytokines on these different diffusion MRI metrics. So including uh, free water, um, tissue specific FA, as well as the conventional FA in a large sample of um, patients with schizophrenia and healthy controls. And we um, hypothesized that um, the um, association between circulating levels of cytokines um, would be selectively associated with the free water metric. So in uh, this particular study, um, this was comprised from the um, Australian Schizophrenia Research Bank, and it consisted of a relatively large number of people with schizophrenia, almost 500, and a bit over 600 healthy controls. And um, in collaboration or from our collaborator, um, Cynthia Weikert from Neura, um, we obtained the following um, cytokines. And in terms of just the basic between group differences, we found that there were significant alterations in the following cytokines. 
um, between patients and controls. And this was broadly consistent with the literature um, and implicated um, you know, the standard ones such as TNF-alpha being higher as well as interleukin-6 being higher as well. Now, in terms of just the, um, uh, the white matter microstructure, again, um, consistent with the, the literature, we found um, increased free water as well as decreased tissue specific FA and decreased FA in individuals with schizophrenia compared to healthy controls. And this was done on a voxel wise basis. And as you can see, um, these differences um, essentially encompassed most of the white matter skeleton. So it was uh, quite widespread. Um, now, we were most interested in this study in determining or uh, testing the relationship between the different circulating cytokines and the diffusion metrics. So we did this firstly using just the average um, uh, metrics over the white matter skeleton. And in this panel B, this shows the, the plots of the, each of the cytokines plotted um, against the different diffusion metrics, such as free water, tissue-specific FA and FA. And we found um, a significant association or a positive association between um, IL-6 and TNF-alpha with um, free water. And we didn't, and this was indicated by higher levels of these um, particular cytokines being associated with higher free water. But we didn't actually observe any associations um, with the tissue specific FA and the conventional FA. And when we um, uh, separated this um, by diagnostic status in examined patients in controls separately, we revealed that there was this positive significant positive association in the patients, um, whilst a no um, association in the healthy controls. And this is shown by the, the, the thick red line here. Um, so we were also interested in determining the spatial location of some of these associations, um, particularly between IL-6 and TNF-alpha. So, and this was done on a voxel wise basis. So examining the association at every voxel across the white matter skeleton. So here across the whole sample, again, we um, found um, a significant positive association between IL-6 and TNF-alpha with higher free water levels, which uh, encompassed or went, uh, sort of extended across most of the white matter skeleton. Um, but when we examined the association in um, patients in controls separately, we um, found um, a significant positive association in patients, which was quite spatially widespread, as you can see in the plot, the third row here, but was particularly predominant in these kind of interior colossal fibers and thalamic radiation fibers. Whilst in the healthy controls, this um, association was very spatially circumscribed and was confined um, mainly to the interior um, component of the corpus callosum. Um, and so this was a difference between a sort of patients and healthy controls here in terms of the spatial location of the associations. So to summarize um, the findings of this particular study, um, we verified that there was widespread dysregulation in the serum cytokine levels in people with schizophrenia. And this was done in one of um, the largest samples of the circulating cytokines in schizophrenia to date that we're aware of. We found that higher pro-inflammatory signaling was um, selectively linked to higher free water in white matter, um, and that this relationship was more pronounced and spatially widespread in individuals with schizophrenia. So again, um, consistent with our previous study, that uh, Lily study that was looking at gray matter morphology, we also found that the frontal cortex or frontal regions, um, in, in this case with, in white matter, might be particularly sensitive to elevations in inflammatory cytokines. So again, it might be pointing to some kind of vulnerability there. And we also found that pro-inflammatory cytokines were selectively associated with free water, but were not associated with a, a conventional FA or the tissue specific FA. And so this might suggest that um, inflammation could be a mechanism underlying higher brain free water. And perhaps that you know, free water might represent a, a promising biomarker of brain inflammation, although um, this does need to be um, elucidated and empirically investigated further. So 
I'm now going to turn um, uh, my attention to another particular aspect of the immune system called the complements pathway and describe a couple of recent studies that have examined this pathway in psychosis in the remaining time that I might have. Um, so firstly, um, for those who don't know what the complement system um, is, um, it essentially is this family of sort of 60 or so circulating proteins that are part of the innate immune system and whose role it is to essentially complement the activity of the immune system to complement the activity of antibodies and phagocytic cells. And so these um, collection of proteins um, uh, sort of activate each other in this cascade-like or synergistic sort of manner. Um, and this is depicted in a simplistic form in the plots or schematics to the right here. So the complement um, components um, or pathway has a, a range of functions as listed here, but one um, which includes phagocytosis of um, pathogens via this uh, C3B component. Now, um, the complement system has been of particular interest or relevance to psychosis for a number of um, high profile sort of findings or reasons. Um, so for example, um, in the introduction, I mentioned that one of the um, genetic loci that was associated with schizophrenia risk was the major histocompatibility histo complex. And so I studied um, done now a couple of years ago um, that was published in Nature at the time, um, found that this genetic association in schizophrenia may be partly explained by structural variation of the complement four component gene. And in this study, they found that having a greater number of C4A copies, um, as well as having higher levels of C4A um, RNA expression in the postmortem brain um, was reported or associated with schizophrenia risk. So in parallel to this finding um, that generated quite a bit of interest at the time, a role for complement in um, neurodevelopment has also been described. Um, and so in mice, um, classical components um, of the complement pathway has been described to promote or aid um, microglial mediated synaptic elimination. And so it does this by essentially tagging weak synapses and telling microglia um, what synapses to engulf or far, uh, to, to engulf. Um, and so one of the reasons these findings have been really of interest in the schizophrenia fields is because this notion of there being aberrant synaptic pruning is one of the most dominant or etiological models of schizophrenia that was first proposed about sort of 40 years ago by Ian Feinberg. And although there has remained a lack of sort of empirical support for, for this particular theory, it has still remained quite influential. And so this contemporary version of this um, synaptic pruning model now kind of suggests that um, complement dysregulation might be a mediator of this aberrant synaptic pruning um, in schizophrenia might be sort of a mechanism at play here. So we've examined, um, given this sort of background, the complement pathway in psychosis in a couple of studies now to date, um, some are still underway. Um, and so again, in a study that was led by Lily, um, we examined um, peripheral um, complement proteins in um, the psychosis spectrum um, across, again, clinical high risk, first episode psychosis and chronic schizophrenia individuals. And in this study, we found um, higher C3 as well as C4 component levels in clinical high risk and first episode, as well as the C4 in chronic schizophrenia compared to their um, age match counterparts. Um, but it is to be noted, particularly for this study, that after we adjusted for BMI, the associations in the first episode group actually disappeared. So this does suggest that the elevations in these components in the FEP group were partly attributed to BMI. And we speculate that this may have been due to um, recent commencement of antipsychotic medication. And uh, the reason why I do mention it in this study is because the previous literature had actually um, failed to adjust for a lot of these confounds. So it does kind of indicate the importance of actually considering things such as BMI. Um, so in this study, we're also um, interested in examining the relationship of the complement proteins with clinical symptoms. 
And we did this in this study in, with um, a multivariate um, manner um, using um, canonical correlation analysis. So in this plot here, plot A and plot B, this shows the canonical weights for the actual uh, clinical symptoms, as well as in panel B for the complement proteins. Um, and in this particular um, analysis, we've um, detected one sort of latent association. And this found that um, higher levels of C4 and with lower levels of C3 components were associated with higher negative and positive um, symptoms across the, the psychosis groups. Um, and so we speculated that this might have actually been due to there being an imbalance between C4 and C3 levels. And this was supported when we examined the association of the ratio of C4 to C3 levels, um, which was associated with higher positive symptoms across the group adjusting for age. Um, so again, it's a bit of a whirlwind of some of these studies. So I'm just going to move on to a recent study, which is still in preparation. Um, so here in the, in the previous study that I just described, you'll notice that we examined um, the complement components in the, just the peripheral blood. However, the relevance of complements or to schizophrenia in particular has been of interest because of its role potentially within the brain. So it is of interest to try to um, examine um, markers um, or ways of indexing the brain a bit more closely. And we can do this with use of cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Um, so in this particular study, we were fortunate to obtain um, both CSF and serum across a couple of groups. And this was by a collaborator, Marcus Lewecki, within his particular um, biobank. And we examined, um, or we obtained this in antipsychotic naive first episode psychosis individuals. Um, again, having an antipsychotic group is quite um, pertinent given the potential effects of medication on these components, um, as well as individuals who were deemed to be at clinical high risk for psychosis and healthy controls. And although the sample size you know, is quite small, it is you know, quite a, a difficult um, task to get uh, um, CSF via lumbar puncture and serum in these individuals. And we've recently sort of established collaboration with the complement experts, Mikey Hurick and Melanie Fokin, who from the UK. Um, and we examined um, a, a larger number of complement proteins as listed here. These tap into the so-called classical pathway, as well as um, including some kind of regulators of the complement pathway. So in terms of just some of our findings, so in the um, CSF, um, we didn't find any difference in the complement um, components within our first episode or CHR group in comparison to healthy controls for any of the components. But as you might um, sort of see in this plot, which is actually um, plotting the raw values, the values do appear to be higher in, in particular in first episode psychosis. And this was particularly um, driven by an association with BMI as well as freezer storage time, given that these samples were actually relatively old and had been stored for some time. So I think the jury is still out and I think there needs to be a, you know, more work in particular um, done on uh, examining complement component levels in CSF, particularly because um, these components are in very small amounts in CSF and are hard to therefore assay. But in um, the serum, we found significantly higher levels of complement component levels um, in for all components in both first episode psychosis and clinical high risk individuals. Um, and this was found again for all with the exception of C3, although it was tending to be um, uh, trending to be higher. And this again was um, adjusting for these particular confounds, including BMI and freezer storage time, as well as sex. Now, because we actually had um, protein levels in both the serum and the CSF in, in the same subjects, this afforded us an opportunity to examine whether um, uh, the protein levels in serum and CSF were associated with each other. So as you can see in this correlation, correlation uh, matrix, um, there was a significantly um, positive significant positive associations of the proteins within each of their respective um, biological fluid. 
However, there was no significant association across the whole sample between um, complement component levels in the serum and the CSF, as um, shown or represented here by this green uh, square. And so this lack of an association might actually suggest that serum may not be a good biomarker for representing the activity of complement in the CSF. Um, but we also examined um, um, the associations in each of the groups separately. And interestingly, I mean, this is something that still needs to be unpacked a bit further. We found that in first episode psychosis, there were some negative associations between um, the serum and CSF um, components, um, sort of uh, encompassing um, serum C3 as well as CSF C4. Um, but there was an absence of any association in CHR and also healthy controls. And in healthy controls, it sort of appears to be a, a represented by a positive association. Um, so again, this is just sort of early um, analyses, but it is interesting and might sort of indicate that um, the complement expression could actually change between the CHR and the first episode. Um, period, although this does need to be examined further. So in this study, we've also examined um, the association between the complement components and clinical symptoms in both serum and CSF. So we didn't find any associations between symptoms with um, these levels in the CSF, but in serum, we found significant positive associations across most of the complement components in the first episode psychosis. And this was particularly for um, both negative as well as general symptoms as shown by the sort of positive slopes here. Um, and we didn't find any associations in the clinical high risk um, group. And again, as I mentioned, um, there were no associations um, between complement components and in the CSF and clinical symptoms. So this is interesting, sort of indicating again that these higher levels of complement components are um, vary with variations in clinical severity in first episode psychosis. <clears throat> so I just now, lastly, want to um, um, quickly go over some more preliminary findings relating to the complement pathway. Uh, that's going to be further investigated across the psychosis spectrum using data from the um, International Pronia Consortium. Um, and again, this is just preliminary work at this stage. So the Pronia Consortium is an international consortium that's aimed at identifying um, personalised prognostic markers for psychosis. It consists of a number of um, sites within the EU as shown here, as well as one site in Australia, Melbourne, which is um, MNC, as well as um, Origin Youth Health. So in this study, um, uh, proteomic data has already been assayed in um, the blood samples that were obtained. And this was um, done in 205 healthy controls, a clinical high risk for psychosis individuals, as well as individuals at recent onset psychosis. And um, this proteomic um, analysis yielded 300, 340 proteins. And of these particular pro proteins, we identified that 33 of these were related to the complement pathway. And these were selected for further analysis in this particular study. So at this stage, um, only some really preliminary findings have been done, um, which I'll just quickly go over, and it does need to be sort of unpacked and verified further. Um, but in that um, as comparison of these proteins in recent onset psychosis, in comparison to healthy controls, we found that 11 or nearly a third of these proteins are significantly altered in um, the recent onset psychosis compared to, to the control group. And these significantly different proteins are illustrated here in the word cloud. And those that are, are higher are indicated in blue and those that are um, lower to healthy controls are uh, represented in red. And those that are, have a larger text uh, indicate a larger effect size. So you can actually see here um, that um, there's a lot of reds, uh, more reds indicating lower levels of the proteins in the rock group, which is interesting. Um, but 
some of these particular complement components do actually have these broad sort of functions and some might actually um, promote or activate the complement pathway and some might actually have an inhibitory function where they regulate or inhibit the particular pathway. Um, and so when we actually stratify the particular um, complement proteins by their broad functions, whether they're activating or inhibitory, we actually see that two, nearly two thirds of the differences um, have an overall activating effect on the complement cascade. And so this is indicated by there being lower levels of the inhibitory or regulatory proteins in the recent onset psychosis group. So this um, suggests that there might be um, a lack of complement regulation perhaps. So in contrast, um, however, so the preliminary findings in the CHR group were uh, are really quite interesting. So this found um, that 24 or nearly three quarters of the um, complement proteins are significantly altered in the CHR relative to the healthy controls. And those that were significantly altered are, are again listed here in the word cloud. You can see here that there is a lot more blues. So indicating that the complement components um, were higher in the CHR in, in comparison to healthy controls. Um, so again, when we actually stratify this um, in according to their sort of broad functions of whether they're sort of activating or inhibitory on the pathway, um, like um, the ROP comparison, I find that nearly two thirds or two thirds have an overall activating effect on the complement cas cascade. But in contrast to the comparison ROP, um, this is indicated by there being a higher um, levels of this sort of more so-called activating proteins um, as indicated in blue. Um, so again, these are early sort of findings um, indicating sort of a potential alterations within this pathway in particularly CHR. And there needs to be a lot more work done to verify some of these associations. But in terms of some next analyses, um, we plan to do a network analysis on the complement proteins to ascertain how the proteins might actually relate to each other and whether this actually might differ to healthy controls. So again, here, we, you know, it's uh, possible that we might see that there's a fragmentation of the, how the complement components actually um, interrelate um, in the patient groups compared to healthy controls. Um, and we might um, also or, or plan to, to see how the particular cascade is related to clinical symptoms as well as change in cl clinical symptoms, given that there is longitudinal data in this study. So <clears throat> now I know I'm at time, so I've just got one or two more slides. So in terms of just what's next, um, I haven't touched on any kind of factors that actually might moderate or mediate um, the immune pathways. Um, but this is something that is of interest to us, in particular examining uh, different environmental factors such as early life adversity um, and how this actually might moderate um, the immune system and represent a pathway that might link early life adversity to later development of psychosis. This is something that is of particular interest to um, PhD student Megan Thomas, who's recently submitted a, a systematic review on this area. And also um, in terms of exploring the impacts of different kind of um, comorbidities or physical health um, on um, the immune system, um, which is obviously quite relevant. Um, and this is something that is being explored with the ATN. And I, I mentioned um, that there was, in, in terms of some of the role of complements, having a role in neurodevelopment, um, this, most of this work has come from animal models, which have proposed that complements actually might mediate this kind of synaptic pruning. And so this is important to actually try to test and translate some of these findings that are really kind of only mainly kind of um, um, stemming from animal models um, and try to actually test that in living humans as best as we can. And so this just takes me to an ongoing study called the proteins of the immune system in psychosis or PIPS. Um, this is um, being driven by um, uh, Ali, Ali Stevens, a, the study coordinator. It's an ongoing study which acquire, is acquiring bloods, um, CSF, as well as multimodal imaging. And what we're wanting to do here is to examine some of the um, neuroimmune interactions in vivo. And to attempt to um, examine some of the kind of synaptic changes, um, we're actually in collaboration with Antoine Clauser, 
um, examining whole brain phosphorus magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And here we're focusing on some metabolites that are putatively um, um, meant to index um, neuropil contraction and expansion. And what we hoped to do um, is to examine particular um, um, inflammatory molecules, uh, particularly uh, different ISO forms or types of the C4 proteins, such as C4A and C4B, and to examine how they might be um, differentially associated with some of these metabolites, these particular MRS metabolites across the brain, as well as um, other um, immune molecules in general. So <clears throat> here, um, before I wrap up, um, uh, here is just a, a last slide that summar uh, summarizes how some of our studies might support or not this sort of theory of there being inflammation in um, psychosis or schizophrenia. Um, here you can see that there is a bit more evidence pointing to the for than the against. Um, the against is quite relevant, really kind of focusing on the absence of TSPO um, um, in the, the psychosis spectrum. So overall, um, I think, you know, the evidence um, presented does indicate that uh, psychosis is likely a disorder of inflammation or immune um, dysregulation, but um, that it is somewhat dependent on how inflammation might actually be defined, as well as the molecules or biological markers and the stage of illness that is examined. So again, uh, the relationship is, as I mentioned at the outset, somewhat um, nuanced and complex. So um, I just want to um, acknowledge a, a, lo a lot of individuals that have been involved in this work, in particular, of course, Maria and Lily, as well as Christos Bentalis um, and other individuals at MNC um, and individuals from um, the Australian Schizophrenia Research Bank, Pronia, as well as um, Marcus um, Lewicki and his biobank. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thanks, Vanessa. That was an amazing presentation. Um, really impressive body of work, and it's uh, you know just really exemplifies your skill set. You've been able to cover so many different methodologies, from structural neuroimaging, diffusion, um, diffusion imaging, PET, blood-based biomarkers, CSF. It's just really fantastic to see. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to open up to questions now. If you have a question, can you pop it into the chat, and I will read it out to Vanessa. Um, just while we're waiting on the questions to come in, Vanessa, I just had a, a quick question to ask you. Just going back to the study um, that Lily had um, completed, um, I, you, you pointed out there was this sort of strange moderation effect where we saw an increase in the, um, was it uh, volume maybe or, or thickness of the brain, the frontal cortex that correlated with higher cytokines. Um, or higher, yeah, an increase in cytokines um, in the healthy controls, but there was the opposite effect mm -hmm. in the early psychosis group. And obviously the, the opposite effect is the more intuitive effect. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like what, uh, yeah, what might be, have you got any ideas about what might be going on there and why we see a, this positive correlation in the, in the healthy group? Yeah. Um, yeah any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's really interesting. And it was not something that we um, expected at the outset. You're right, mm -hmm. it's not intuitive probably have covered it in a lot in the um, paper, which I'm trying to remember, mm. of course. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I think certainly we hypothesized that it might be just having this quite um, a good balance because this consisted of both um, pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, some of those cytokines that were associated with, uh, with frontal cortical thickness, that it might kind of re represent having this kind of healthy um, balance. Um, that is actually associated with greater cortical thickness. I think some of those cytokines also might exert some kind of um, uh, oxidative or have an impact on, on some oxidative pathways as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, yeah. yeah, you're right that the more intuitive association was in the first episode group that did show that negative association. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd have to, yeah, go back um, to the actual our discussion within the paper, which I know we elaborated on it, but it Again, our hypothesis was that it really might represent this kind of robust um, um, immune system in um, healthy controls that might have been kind of mm -hmm. more so driving that association that we found there. Really interesting. Thanks, Vanessa, for answering that. And um, I guess that's a little bit of a plug to go and have a look at Lily's paper, which was published where, Vanessa? <laughs> you don't mind reminding um, us? Uh, brain <laughs> behaviour and immunity. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
cool. Um, I've noticed that in the um, the chat, Sarah has actually asked the same question. So thank you for answering that. I'm, it seems a few of us had that same question. Um, yeah, so it doesn't look like any other questions have popped up. Um, I just had one more question, Vanessa, if you don't mind me asking. Um, so I think later on when you were talking about the CSF work, um, you showed that uh, there was this increase in um, CSF in the FEP group, but uh, let me just see, a trend for an increase in CSF in the FEP group and less mm. so in the clinical high risk group, which suggests that there was something happening um, sort of between that transition period um, into first episode psychosis. So I was just wondering if you had any, if you could comment a little bit more on that about what might be going on and why we might, why you might see that happening. Yeah, so this was in terms of the associations between serum and CSF, mm. so the, of the actual complement yeah. components within serum and also mm. CSF, and that overall yeah. across the whole sample, there really isn't any association. Um, so this, yeah, it does sort of indicate in terms of that um, association that really using serum mm. as sort of a marker of what might be mm -hmm. actually happening within the brain or the CSF is probably, you know, not, not the best thing to do. I can't probably mm. infer that. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, yeah, there were these negative associations. Now, again, the sample size is small mm. here. It is uncorrected, but um, I think some would actually survive. Now, interestingly, it is a negative association. Um, it, it, mm. and that is absent in yeah. clinical high risk. So it, it's again, um, and the clinical high risk is, it looks to, it appears to be more similar to the healthy controls. Now here, I guess it, it's just such early days. It's something that I'm kind of working with um, Mikey Hurick, who really is this complement expert. Like that's all she does is she's just a, a complement pathway mm -hmm. expert because the complement pathway is actually really quite complex and nuanced. Um, and so mm. I don't know how, if I could really speculate so much on the mechanism at play here, but it does kind of suggest that there might be some sort of difference or change that is occurring in terms of how um, the, you know, the complement pathway in the periphery and central symptoms are interacting between clinical high risk and FEP. Of course, they are different people. So that does need mm. to be kind of considered as mm. well. So I'm probably not being able to answer that much you know, answer that too much. Um, it's not published as yet, um, but it, it, mm -hmm. it is an interesting um, finding nonetheless and um, I probably just need a bit mm. of time to think through it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's really fantastic and it's um, I'll definitely be on the lookout for that paper when it comes out. Uh, I think it's, it's probably a, a pretty necessary paper to be showing these correlations between, yeah, um, the central nervous system Immune, uh, immune markers as well as the kind of peripheral nervous system immune markers because this has been one of the questions right for a very long time as to how do they actually correlate to your answering a very important question even if it's kind of come out with some kind of confusing results I think it's really um, crucial information to have so yeah um, okay so we've got no more questions come, uh, come through so I guess it's time to wrap up just on the hour um, so if everyone can just join me in thanking Vanessa for an amazing presentation um, and yeah, really looking forward to seeing some future work come from Vanessa's group. So thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. Well done, Vanessa. That's so good. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad that's done. Um, um, yeah. I yeah. Uh, we'll see okay. you. I think everyone's slugging off. Yes. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs> yes, we'll do. Thanks for sharing. All right. See ya. See ya. All good. Thanks for speaking. <laughs> Bye.